The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, just waiting about a minute for everyone to arrive and then we'll get started. Okay, so I have one o'clock on the uh, on my phone, so I'll get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth webinar of CISD's 2020 Responsible Care Webinar Series, where we will be given a tour of the re retired CCPX 911 tank car using the new vir virtual reality uh, tools that will eventually be used to train individuals on railway safety, promoting and ensuring the safe transportation of dangerous goods in Canada. Now, you may be surprised to see my face today instead of my colleague, Erin Naor. Um, my name is Danielle Morrison, and I have actually taken over as the Responsible Care Webinar Series Facilitator. So I'm an Environment and Health Policy Analyst here at CIC, and I'm very excited to be getting involved with these webinars. Now, before jumping into the tour, I will provide a bit of background on the tank car that you can see here, um, as well as our panelists. So after nearly three decades of traveling from town to town, providing a unique backdrop for municipalities, first responders, and residents to learn about the transportation of dangerous goods from TransCare members, uh, TransCare Safety Train, the CCPX 911 tank car, was officially retired on March 28, 2018. And then in June 2019, it embarked on a new journey by road. It made its way to the Fire and Emergency Services Training Institute, or FESD, grounds at Pearson International Airport where it will continue to serve its role, uh, training first responders on railway safety and the tr uh, safe transportation of dangerous goods. And then in August 2019, CIC was pleased, pleased to learn its proposal for Transcor Transport Canada funding for renewed uh, TransCare tools and cross-country outreach uh, was successful. The proposal included rationale and costing for developing a virtual reality program and tools, building a new safety training tank car, and hosting a series of outreach events across the country. The first phase of the project, VR training, is well underway and will hopefully launch in the next few months. So today we are joined by two panelists who each played a key role in the development of this virtual reality training program, Andy Ash and Jean-Pierre Couture. Andy has been working in the railway industry for over 40 years, is a certified railway car inspector, tank car specialist, and currently serves as the Director of Dangerous Goods for the Railway Association of Canada. Andy has produced and delivered many training courses on various aspects of the transportation of dangerous goods in transport in Canada. Um, he has also responded to hundreds of incidents involving dangerous goods and continues to do so. He and his team at the Railway Association of Canada also train first responders on how to approach and deal with dangerous goods incidents. Jean-Pierre, or JP, has 42 years of experience in the railway industry and 33 years in dangerous goods uh, emergency response and transcare activities. He has held numerous management positions within field operations and headquarters over his 23 years at CN. Um, and in October 2000, G JP actually became the TGG Specialist for Eastern Canada at the Railway Association of Canada, where his responsibilities have included assisting and supporting member railways and plants, uh, transcare community outreach with first, first responders, conducting training, inspections and audits, producing and revising regu regulatory training programs for the TDGS team, um, and ma maintaining a good relationship with regulatory government agencies, to just name a few. So we are very happy and uh, lucky to have these two here today. Um, and a few things to note before we get started. Uh, you have all been placed on mute for the duration of the webinar. However, if at any point you have questions, please feel free to use the question function, um, which is shown as a tab here. And there will be an opportunity at the end for a Q&A session. The webinar will also be recorded. So if you have uh, questions or miss anything um, or have colleagues that were unable to attend, uh, the webinar will be made available afterwards. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Andy to begin taking us through the tour. Um, he'll start with the bottom of the tank car, move towards the top, and finally, we will go inside. So just give us a moment while we uh, switch up our screens here. Okay. Let 
Looks good, Andy. Okay, super. All right, thanks, Danielle. Uh, firstly, uh, before we get started, I, I want to, uh, on behalf of the uh, the RAC Dangerous Goods team, I want to thank uh, CIAC, um, uh, Jeff and, and Danielle and Christina and Kara um, for, for their help and, and their, uh, their willingness to get into this, the, the VR program, which is, uh, which is a really excellent tool. I think you're going to like it. Um, but, uh, you know, we've had a great working relationship over, uh, over quite a few decades and, and we'll continue to do that. And I, I just want to thank, uh, thank CIAC for inviting us to, uh, come and help present today. So, uh, let's get in. Let's get on with it here. Um, I want we want to talk about the CCPX 911 rail car. It still lives, um, as uh, as Danielle mentioned. It's uh, it's residing now at uh, Festi out of Pearson Airport, and um, an interesting ride from uh, from Windsor, Ontario, to uh, to Festi on the uh, 401 on the on a float uh, and truck. That made some for some interesting pictures, but. Uh, but here it is, and, and you know what? If you're ever flying in and out of Festi, it's right. Uh, it's right at the northwest corner, uh, out of Pearson, I should say. And it's a uh, Festi's at the northwest corner of Pearson, uh, right next to one way runway 23, which is the northernmost east-west runway. And so, if you're flying in, take a look outside the window, and you'll see our beautiful 911 car still there. Uh, as again, as Daniel mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at the outside and, and bottom of the rail car first, and then we're gonna go up on top, and then we'll uh, we'll finish off inside the rail car. Um, keep in mind that you know we, we do we do a lot of training for the first responders, and um, and and of course uh, we we also work with industry folks in in, in trans care. Um, and that's why this car is such a valuable tool, and that's why it's so important that we get a new one. But um, you know this car is 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 a is a real tank car, but it's not a typical tank car because it's been modified. This car was originally built in 1966, and and in uh, 1991, uh, with the with the help of our friends at Procore, uh, this car is converted into a classroom on wheels. So um, what you see is is not typical of of a rail car. And my little hand cursor here is going to be my pointer. Um, and you can see on the top of the rail car, we've got all kinds of different uh, uh, protective housings uh, that enclose valves and fittings and whatnot. Uh, down the bottom of the rail car, we have various different bottom outlet valves that we will uh, that we'll will show. Um, as far as again, they're different designs. Um, and the car itself, you know, just to, um, uh, just to just to cover off some of the safety items uh, before before we uh, really start getting into the rail car itself, is I want to talk a little bit about railway safety. You know, if we're if we're uh, ever going to go into a rail yard, and this is what we tell first responders, the first thing you want to do is you want to notify the railway you're there. We want we need to know that you are there so that we can protect you, and we have to do uh, and that's that's accomplished by getting track protection. We can get positive positive track protection from a railway official. Uh, that way, there won't be any movement on the track. But keep in mind also that if you're in the yard or, or major main lines, um, there may be live tracks right adjacent to where we are. So um, that'll all be covered off um, with uh, with the railway safety briefing uh, when we uh, when we get started. So um, that's important to note first off. Uh, the other thing is, is that again, we don't want the, uh, uh, you know, if we're working on this 911 car or any other kind of rail car, we don't want to move. So we're going to have uh, have our uh, the railway brakes on the rail car. We're going to have wheel chocks. You see down the end. We'll take a look at that a little closer later. We'll chalk the wheels on the rail car so it doesn't move. In the railway business, we have blue flags, and, and what they do is they uh, they're mounted on on the track on the rail. And uh, they notify uh, railway uh, railway people, railway crews that there is somebody working there and not go there. But of course, we'd also have positive positive protection too, as far as locking switches and and uh, and that kind of thing. So again, safety is top priority when we're on railway property. Now, just to talk a little bit about the the this this rail car itself. Um, it used to be a tank car. It technically, can't be called a tank car anymore because of all the modifications that have been done to it. Because it's now not not typically a spec tank car as recognized by uh, uh, the AAR Tank Car Committee and DOT and Transport Canada. But um, but this car is an old spec 111 tank car, non-pressure car. It used to be a flammable liquid service. And um, just to uh, just to begin with uh, some of the uh, some of the makeup. 
Uh, gross weight on rail, this particular car is 263,000 pounds. Uh, that's the weight of the rail car and the, and the maximum lading it could uh, it can have in it. So 263. The newer tank cars these days are 280 up to 286, uh, 286,000 pounds, and uh, and that and that's that's standard right across right across the industry. Um, again, uh, construction of tank cars is is um, is pretty simple but complicated at the same time because it's got to be done by registered certified tank car builders um it's rolled steel makes up the barrel of the rail car rolled steel that's the robot welded and and of course x-rayed there are tank heads at the end of at the end of a tank car which again circumferential welds again robot welds hold that in place and the uh, the barrel and the, and the heads are, are placed on a tank saddle arrangement. You can see where my cursor is there. That's we call it a body bolster or a tank saddle. And that's also that the well, the car is welded to that as well. As we get down towards the bottom, we have trucks or bogies, if you so desire. Uh, these trucks, uh, the rail car and all rail cars are much are much the same as this. Is they just sit on the trucks themselves. They're not welded, chained, bolted onto the truck. Um, it's strictly by gravity. Uh, that way, it allows the trucks, when they're in motion, uh, to nego negotiate curves in the track. So they will swivel uh, underneath the uh, underneath the uh, the car body itself because it just sits in a round center plate at both ends of the, at both ends of the rail car. So um, you know that's that's how that works. And and I'll take a we'll we'll take a little closer look at that as well. A couple really important things to remember. I guess one of the most important things to remember when, if uh, for emergency responders, first responders, is identifying what is in the rail car as far as dangerous goods, hazardous materials. Um, that's paramount. We're uh, we can't come close. We're not going to come close to uh, any kind of rail car unless we know what's there. What are the dangers? And the best way to figure that out is number one, talk to the railway, and. And what we need to know is the reporting marks of the rail car. This is CCPX 9911, alphanumeric. No other rail car in North America has that designation. It's got its own serial number, like its own license plate. Every rail car is different. If I was to, if I go to the railway and say this, I need information on this car, we can find out exactly what is in the car, shipping name, UN number, a class, uh, uh, where it's coming from, where it's going to, the shipper. 24-hour um, emergency phone numbers, uh, ERAP information, all kinds of good stuff like that, quantities. Um, we can find out all that information just by referring to the reporting marks on the rail car. And this is on both sides and both ends of the rail car. Uh, some tank cars now, the builders are putting uh, the initial number, the reporting marks on the top of the rail car as well, which is very good. That's not a regulatory requirement, but it's a great uh, management practice. It's a good tool. Uh, so that's good. Um, and again, different types of tank cars for different types of uh, commodities out there. Again, like I mentioned, this is a, a non-pressure or low-pressure tank car, Spec 111. Uh, this particular tank car is, has a tank shell of 7 16 inch thick. And this is uh, not a jacketed rail car. This is the actual tank shell you see it see itself. So um, that's, uh, let me just uh, move along here. Um, and you can see, uh, again, tank, uh, most tank cars do not have doors. So if we look, uh, if we look towards, the, towards the one end of the rail car, again, you see, you see the trucks. And then as, uh, as, we, uh, as we move along, uh, again, one of, the, one of the things I was, I was mentioning is this car is not jacketed. And let me just move a little bit down here. We'll get a little closer. You can see, you can see the welds on the, on the, on the tank shell itself. That's uh, that's holding the whole thing together. Again, these welds are all X-rayed and they're all certified. And you know, this particular car actually had a uh, had a, a life of over 50 years, and um, and that's generally the lifespan of of tank uh, of of uh, rail cars these days uh, from an interchange standpoint. But keep in mind, as I mentioned, some some tank cars can be jacketed as well, and that's important to realize also. Because uh, if we're have a, at an a accident uh, type scenario where there may be damage to the uh, means of containment, uh, we need to know. We need to be able to understand whether we're looking at the actual tank shell itself or a tank jacket. Uh, the reason why there are tank jackets on there is because there may be thermal protection or, or insulation 
uh, that are applied between the jacket and the tank shell and the jacket just holds it all together and I'll show you a little bit of that when we get inside the rail car. Okay now moving along again there's our wheel chocks and our trucks um, again we have uh, qualification stencils here again this is for our shippers you know, before they load the car, they got to ensure that this car is in date for qualification. The tank car's got to be qualified, and there's a very specific process for that. Uh, every 10 years, uh, uh, for 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 the most part, and then uh, for our service equipment, pressure relief devices, safety valves is usually five years uh, duration before they got to be retested. So there again, this is all by spec. And then, if I can uh, zoom in a little bit here. You can uh, you can see the uh, tank car spec, and this is a 111 A100. And again, 111 is just a standard uh, uh, non-pressure type tank car. The 100 is the uh, tank test pressure. So uh, again, that's uh, that's that's important. That's important to know. Again, um, when we're uh, when we as tank car specialists are are doing any kind of damage assessment, it's it's just to get all that information that we need to know. Okay, and there you can see your, our, our tank saddle itself. So let's uh, let's just take a little scoot around the end of the car here. All right, nice sunny day out there at uh, Fasti. Okay, here's the end of the rail car. Remember, I said you got the uh, reporting marks both sides, both ends, and it also has a capacity of uh, water capacity in liters and gallons. This particular rail car is just uh, just over twenty thousand U.S. gallons capacity. Um, Looking at today's tank cars, uh, that's 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 a lot. But you know, today's tank cars we can have around 36,000 gallon capacity in in those cars. Remember, I talked about the brake system. There's two different types of brake system on all rail cars. We have a handbrake system, a mechanical system. We can just turn this wheel counterclockwise, and it'll physically put the brake shoes on the wheels, and that way we can make sure the car's not gonna roll away on us again and of course we would use wheel chocks if we're working on a specific car also we have an air brake system every rail car has air brake systems not just tank cars but all all railway uh, rolling stock has an air brake system these are the control portions this is a air reservoir for the car on the end we have an air hose and all the air hoses between the rail cars are coupled together with a glad hand system and that's fed uh, compressed air right from a lead locomotive that has a compressor, and usually 70 to 90 PSI. And the crew on the locomotive uses that to control train speed and, and thus handling of the train when it's out on the road. And that's what, that's the, that's what it's designed for. Uh, some of the other fa uh, safety features that is uh, typical of a tank car is they got to have double shelf couplers. And here we can see a little, uh, little closer of the uh, double shelf. And, uh, and the uncoupling lever, I'll get off that. You can see the double shelf. What that does for tank cars is it's a requirement and just in the event of an accident, they don't get separated and the couplers don't get separated and punch a hole in the, in the end of the rail car. So they'll stay together. Um, and again, I mentioned the uncoupling lever. Every, every uh, rail car has an uncoupling lever at each end and all we gotta do is lift it up and we can uncouple, we can uncouple the cars if need be. Uh, usually that's for the train operating crews to work with. Some of the safety appliances that we have um, on tank cars, uh, it's it's very well well done with the, our crossover steps. We can move over, you, uh, step over using crossover step and the end railing. But we have uh, sill steps, handholds. Everything's got to be uh, attached uh, securely uh, with bolt arrangements, and um, and which is uh, which is also an important railway safety issue is that. Um, we don't climb underneath rail cars. We don't climb. Uh, we don't climb between rail cars if they're not coupled, uh, because you just never know. That's a bad space to be. And also standing between the rails, uh, that's also a no-no. And even just outside the rail, there's an overhang you can see. So you know, people say, "Well, I'm not between the rails." Well, you're still possibly fouled and could get hurt. And I guess and lastly, one of the other main main rules is. Never step on top of the rail, step over it, okay? Because it can be slippery, ice, grease, that kind of thing. And so the one other one other thing we're gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna pass it over to JP. Remember, uh, use three-point contact when you're climbing up the ladder. So JP, it's all yours, mister. Thank you, Andy. 
Let me bring that up. Okay. I hope everybody can see this. Okay, by magic, we're up on the car. There wasn't really a hard thing to do with this virtual training. So basically, we're looking at the top of the car. Like Andy mentioned, it's been modified to include most of the components that you would find on general service cars as well as pressure cars. Obviously, I'm standing on the side of the general service cars where you have the different components. And one thing that we bring to the first responders uh, view is try to identify the car from a distance. How can we tell if it's a general service or a pressure car? And uh, well, some of these are good indicators like the manway cover. Uh, when you're looking on top of the car and you can see manway cover, that automatically tells you it's a, it's a general service car transporting liquids. With that manway cover, there would also be a pressure relief device, which could be a uh, safety valve, spring-loaded mechanism, or a ruptured disc assembly like we have here. Uh, if for whatever reason there's not a manway on top, but we have a corrosive arrangement, uh, normally that would go hand in hand with the safety vent uh, for the transportation of uh, corrosive products. So instead of having a manway cover, uh, when we're looking, let me get a little bit closer here so you get a better view. You would have your two inch uh, liquid line, your one inch air line, and a an eight inch fill hole. Now, that being said, the third item that would be on there would be the, uh, well, in our way terms, we call it a bread box, but actually, underneath the protective cover, that's where you would find the uh, two inch line the one inch airline, as well as a vacuum breaker on the right hand side here. And basically the vacuum breakers to prevent negative pressure. So let me back off. Okay, over here we have what they call a protective housing that normally would be sitting on top of pressure cars, but uh, as per 2015, uh, the construct uh, the builders, tank car builders have been uh, uh, constructing a new DOT 117 car. And basically, uh, what uh, we wanted to accomplish by that is to put all the different valves and components inside the housing so they are better protected. Of course, these 117 now are dedicated to the, uh, to the uh, transportation of flammable liquids. And as you can see in here, we have a two inch, a two inch uh, liquid line. We have a one inch air line. We have our vacuum breaker, as well as our safety valve. So that would be coupled up to our manway cover. And again, this, this car has been modified, but you find these, uh, these uh, arrangements right in the middle of the car. So, that's basically what you would find on a general service car. So let's move forward and go over to the pressure side of things here. Let me see. Okay. Of course, if you look on your right there, you got a gate that's open and that would have been secured prior to starting our session on top. Okay, let me turn around here. We can see our first housing. And this is actually a DOT 105, which is our chlorine arrangement. And some of the things we pass on to first responders and how, again, you will not normally have to go on the tank car, though, but if for some reason a tank car went up on its side and you would be responding and trying to evaluate what you have, we do indicate to them that the liquid lines are always lined up with the length of the car. So in this, case, in this case, we have two liquid lines and sideways, we got two vapor lines. 
and we got our uh, pressure relief device, uh, which is an external uh, safety valve. And at the bottom of it, there's another safety feature, with, which it's basically a disc, and it's to prevent the product from being in contact with the actual safety uh, spring-loaded mechanism. As you know, chlorine is very corrosive, and we don't want to damage that spring. The other thing you will notice is all the valves are identified. Well, in real life, that's not the case. Look at the thickness of the housing. We're talking about at least seven eighths of an inch. So it basically procures what it says or what it's called, it's protective housing. Uh, you would, uh, when you're looking at the, uh, the, the valves, you could see that there's two, one, two handles that are, have little holes and the other two are kind of filled and uh, in green. Uh, the difference is the, the that's the old style uh, valve where you would have to use a tool to actually tool type them. As to the other two in green, which is the new generation, are uh, you don't require a tool to tighten down. You just do it by hand. Uh, one other feature that there are on the, the uh, chlorine arrangement is we do have excess flow valves below the liquid line. So if by any accident we would tear off one of these valves, the uh, excess flow, because of internal pressure, would move up and block the opening. So this is really a good safety feature. And uh, of course, all the four valves are the same. And that's because there's a chlorine kit that's been developed by the Chlorine Institute where we can actually uh, cap one of those valves. So that's basically your chlorine arrangements. There's the new generation uh, of chlorine cars that have been built, but there's st still a lot of those in uh, transport right now. So if we move up to the next one, and I turn around slightly there. We can see the arrangement. There we go. So this is basically your typical EOT 112 for uh, LPG and hydrous. And again, you can see that uh, all the valves are identified, which would not be the case normally. So without being very technical, uh, on this car, again, we have the two liquid lines that are lined up with the length of the car. We got the safety valve in the middle. Sideways, we have another vapor valve. We also have a, a sampling line, and it really does what it's called. It's just to take a sample of the product. And we have a monitor well, and we have a magnetic gauging device on the hand side here to basically measure outage and de to determine the quantity. And again, look at the thickness of the housing. It's pretty thick, and it does what it's supposed to do. At least in my number of years in response, I've never seen a valve that has been damaged inside one of these housing. Again, uh, we do have excess flow valves in the, this uh, LPG arrangement, and they would be located uh, below the liquid lines, the sampling line, as well as the, uh, the vapor. So let me turn around here. Okay, do. You don't have to work as hard to get over these uh, different housings. So this one here is a CO2 housing. And again, it's quite different from the other two. And it involves two liquid lines. It has as well a vapor a safety valve in the middle. And it's also, it also has regulating valves, which helps to bend the car normally. So that's why you would have them set at 330 PSI, 340 PSI. And you have the safety that's set at 375 PSI. Basically, it's to regulate and make sure the car is able to vent in the normal condition, especially in the hot, warm, sunny day. Again, very thick. And so that's basically what's on top of the car. And like I say, the beauty of it is the fact that we can actually go inside the car to be able to validate 
what we just saw on top of the car. And for first responders, you don't know how comforting it is for them to get a better understanding how these cars are built and uh, all the safety features that come with them. So on that note, I'm going to turn around and bring it back down to Andy that's going to take you inside and give you a little tour of the inside of the car. Andy, back to you. Okay. Coming up. Okay, we're all good there, JP. Yes, sir. Okay, one thing I one thing I forgot to mention here is um, generally in a rail yard, you don't have airplanes. Just saying. So here we are at the end the end of uh, end of our rail car. Uh, the, the other end where the handbrake was was the B. It's considered the B end of the car. The other end of the car is the A end. That's the Canadian end for those who are wondering. And then also we see here again. There's our uh, there's our uh, reporting mark, and, and also we'll uh, there are also a provision for uh, dangerous goods safety marks for placards both sides both ends as well. And here you see our little rusty dirty uh, blue flag, but it still suits the purpose. So let's just take a little walk down, uh, walk down the side of the car. Uh, just a couple, just a couple of quick items here. Um, you'll see these uh, retroflective yellow, yellow type stripes on on the side of the rail car. Uh, again, those are required on all the railway equipment in North America right now, to so that the uh, the car itself is visible if it's in a train at a level crossing that's occupied. So that's that's the whole, whole idea about that. So okay, we'll uh, we'll move on down. I hope. Uh oh. Little slow on the uptake there. That's all right. Doesn't want to take me down here, Danielle. Maybe you could try refreshing the page and we could return to the original view. Uh, well, let me just see if I can go back. Okay, it'll take me back. Oh geez, Danielle. Um, yeah, we could we could try reloading the page again. And as I said, this uh, this program is expect expected to launch in the next few months, so uh, there's still things to be fixed. <laughs> yeah, well, that's never happened before. Figures Murphy's law, right? Let's see, start back where I began. Uh. Andy, I'm wondering if you just want to copy the um, address in a new tab. I think that'll return you to the original view, and then you can just kind of go right in. As a new, as a new tab? I think that might work. Or if I can uh, uh, refresh, maybe? Sure, yeah. Why don't we try that? Let's see what happens. Sorry, folks, that didn't happen in practice. Uh, on numerous occasions, by the way. Yeah.
And maybe while we wait for this to load, we can start thinking of questions. If, uh, if you have any, feel free to send them in the uh, questions tab. All right, fingers crossed here, gang. All right, I think this is going to take us inside the car. Watch your head climbing in. <clears throat> JP, what did you talk about? Yeah, that happened to me once. Slowly loading. Anyway, yeah. okay, we're here. Okay, let's take a walk down the end of the rail car. All right. Um, the one thing that we got to note about the uh, this 911 car is that, uh, again, this is a classroom on wheels and it's not a typical tank car. So generally in the real tank cars, there's not storage cabinets. There are no lights. Just so you know. There are no doors on the sides and usually there's no grating on the bottom of the bottom of the car. But what you do see here is um, you can see the inside of the car and you can just imagine back in the day when this thing used to haul flammable liquids this car being full of gasoline let's say with maybe a little bit of outage on the on the top of on the top of the car on the ceiling there that's a lot that's a lot of product and there are no baffles in tank cars it's just uh, just sitting in there and train crews will feel it but they're still able to properly control their train obviously so um, again, what uh, what this uh, what this particular inside the rail car, and you know, you generally people do not get a chance to get inside a rail car unless you're a certified tank car facility. Um, that's generally not a place you ever go. But you know, with our demonstration purposes, what we got is we got a bunch of bunch of valves that are that are cut away. They're machined so that we can see the inside of the valve. And again, this is for, for training our first responders or tank car specialists or um, technicians. Uh, again, just to the possibility if there's an incident uh, while the car's in transport, if there's a leaky valve or something, there are certain types of in-field emergency repairs we can do to facilitate uh, that car uh, not leaking and be able to move it to a certified shop or back to back to a shipper and get it offloaded and then to a certified shop for get it repaired so and that's that's how we will train the folks there are some things that we can do and i'm just going to quickly run through some of this stuff here that uh, that we have inside the rail car and we hope to put in the new one is uh you know jp talked about the excess flow um you can see see the you know the red slug inside the cylinder and that's you know that would be in under say a liquid valve or something like that and that would slam shut uh, in, in the event if need if needed um, and then some of some of the other things that we might have is um, you know like it's like the sample line uh, an angle ball valve uh, rising stem valves this this one here is a that's a, an internal safety valve you know it's one of the pressure relief devices and what we would do is uh, and like like on the top of the rail car JP showed you the low pressure and end and then we have the high pressure end well it's obviously it's the same inside the rail car too with the valves and we're we're starting at the high pressure end and and um you know this is the co2 one let me just move past it um, what we're looking at now is the uh is the internal piping this is all the piping that is below those valves that jp just showed you on top of the rail car again um we don't see this uh, if you come to a rail yard and there's some kind of accident and you see these pipes something really bad's happened so we don't uh, we don't want to we don't want to uh we don't want to see these pipes but you know you see how the liquid lines go down to the go down to the very bottom to the floor of the rail car you know we have our our our, our floating ball magnetic ball gauge device um and we have our sample line our thermometer well uh, the yellow the yellow is again that's our safety valve and, and then our vapor, you can see that would just be in the vapor space. So again, 
that's that's a piping that's beneath. Um, JP also moving along. This is the the chlorine. You can see how simple that is, and. Uh, and again, here's some of the valves that we, you know, we can we show to demonstrate the different types of valves that uh, maybe in chlorine service. Uh, JP talked about the capping kit that the Chlorine Institute had has developed years and years ago, and it is a great tool. And uh, here we have a cutaway. We show, say, if we had a valve that we couldn't get to stop leaking in the field, um, we can put the shroud over top of it with a gasket down the bottom, and then we can uh, we can we got the strong arm and we can tighten down tighten everything down by using hooks in the protective housing and now you've uh, kept off the valve and we can now move, move it as an emergency move to maybe get offloaded and, and repaired so again uh, you know what I echo what JP said and in, in in all the years I've been around I've never had to respond to a chlorine leaker so um, keep up the good work folks <laughs> we, we appreciate it all right, let's uh, let's move on down a little bit here. Um, let me just have a look up top here. JP showed you the manway, and this is uh, this is the actual manway in the center of the car, the way it was when uh, when it was uh, when it was first built. And and we can see uh, you know underneath the manway cover, what we see here is like a it's like a gauge bar um, for visual sighting for again for outage uh, when loading the rail car. It might have a hose or a stinger sticking in there. And then just fill it up to uh, however many inches inches outage that you may require, and uh, where well, you go, pretty high tech stuff. But they're still out there, and it still works. Again, looking down through the low pressure end of the car, and we can. Uh, I hope I'm not making anybody dizzy. You can see uh, you can see the head, the tank head itself. You can see how it's how it's welded, the circumferential weld, all the way around, and that's how it's welded to the barrel of the rail car. And what we have down here is that we got examples of some GPS uh, GPS devices, and there there is a specific uh, procedure on GPS devices, and you know some of the new technology that's out there, and there's there's even newer ones now that are being installed inside the protective housing of a rail car, which is uh, which is really really handy. Uh, a little further on over, we see these quick disconnects for for maybe liquid or vapor line. Um, and what the quick disconnect means is that there's no venting of any kind of vapor or liquid or anything like that. So we can just disconnect it and it's shut off and there's no uh, no issues for the environment. Again, just some little examples of some of the, some of the newer technologies that are out there. Um, right off the top, I talk about tank, uh, sh uh, tank shell thicknesses. And again, depending on the spec of the car and depending on the product is expected to carry, there are different tank shell thicknesses. Um, like I said, the older 111's got 7 sixteenths. The uh, new 117 tank cars uh, for flammable liquid service is 9 sixteenths, and then we can have our LPGs and hydrous ammonia is 11 sixteenths, 13 sixteenths, and we can go upwards of an inch uh, tank shell thickness. Uh, again, depending on the commodity. But remember, I also mentioned about um, uh, tank jackets as well. And here's an, here we have example of different types of uh, jacket. Uh, different jackets and the material that's behind them, maybe insulation or thermal protection or a combination of both. And again, that's important because again, when we do damage assessment in the field, uh, we got to recognize where that's actually uh, maybe jacketed and maybe not contacting the tank shell itself. Uh, but we need to know again, again, the different standoff distances between the jacket and the shell itself. So again, that just so you know, that's a useful tool and you know what we tell first responders, we're not making metallurgists out of you, but just just to be aware that that is one of our concerns when we're uh, when we're doing down, doing damage assessment. So again, the moving moving on down uh, bottom outlet valve uh, that may be on a low pressure car, uh, um, and you know made top operated bottom outlets, um, different types of uh, liquid lines and air lines, that kind of thing, ball valves. And again, there are different types of infield repairs you could possibly do with these things. Uh, move on down, there's a random wooden box for you. Don't know what that's for. Uh, pressure relief devices. Again, here's, here's one of our uh, safety relief valves. That's a reclosing valve that's internal. Here's an external valve. You see the red spring. Again, different, different styles, makeups. We also have safety vents. Um, there's a rupture disc assembly, and, and, and if they blow due to excess pressure or some kind of hydraulicing of the product inside, 
um, which has uh, been uh, technology has, has pretty much rolled that out nowadays, um, they would have to be replaced, the, the actual rupture discs. And we do have examples of some rupture discs down the bottom. Um, but that they would have to be replaced. Here we have uh, a stone for peroxide. And then we also have, uh, in case of a car drawing a va vacuum, we have vacuum relief breakers, JP mentioned. And again, these uh, these two styles here, they used to, uh, uh, some folks rather uh, incorrectly would step on it uh, to depressure a rail car. That's a no-no. Uh, what it's there for is if the car draws a vacuum, it will actually open on its own and allow air in so that the car does not implode on itself. Um, it's not designed to depressure a rail car. So again, we're using the technology, uh, this newer style, this newer style vacuum relief valve was was designed with a with a hard cap on it, so you can stand on that all day long, and it's not gonna it's not gonna release the valve, but it still operates as a normal uh, vacuum relief valve. Okay. All right, so that, um, and, then on, and then on this car, we have, you know, various different uh, placarding information and whatnot. So um, this is still a good car. It's still still being used for training, and we look forward to working with CIAC on, uh, on the new car. So again, watch your step going down the stairs, and watch your head, don't hit your head. Yeah. And we'll, we'll take you back. Back where we began. Thank you, Danielle. Back to you. Hey. Uh, so thank you once again, Andy and JP. Uh, that was a great tour and very comprehensive, so thank you. Um, I also think it's great that this work was done prior to COVID-19, so we really have the opportunity to shake this properly uh, in a virtual setting. Now, at this point, we will be opening it up to questions, starting with those that have already been received in the chat box. Um, and also feel free to continue sending uh, questions in. So we'll start with a question from Sean, and he is wondering if the numbers on the outside of the car um, identify the thickness layer or um, perhaps if there's a jacket. JP? Pardon me? Do you want to take that or you want me to? Oh, I, I had a bad connection there. I okay. Uh, okay. No, no problem. I'll, I'll pick that up. Uh, well, as far as, uh, you know, as far as telling whether the tank car, the tank shell thickness, um, you really can't tell unless you really know what you're looking at. And I hate, I hate to say that, but again, you know, talk to the railway, talk to the shipper. Uh, we can talk to Canyon Tech, very valuable tool. And we can get, there's never any shortage of any kind of technical information that we can find out. Um, even through our emergency response contractors out there, our SIRSA members, um, they have tank car specialists on staff as well. Um, again, looking at the spec of the car, again, you, you can't see that very well. Uh, but again, if I went back to my reporting marks, I can find out all that information remotely. So again, we can do that. Um, sometimes folks will say, and you talk about a jacket as well, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to see whether there's a, a jacket on the rail car or not. Um, but again, that's where we have to go by the uh, by the spec of the rail car. Um, we can go again by the reporting marks, and even in our training, we uh, we have our we have our students answer those very same kind of questions by giving them a train consist that gives them exactly what kind of product is being shipped. So, for instance, if I if I said I was shipping uh, uh, LPG propane. I'm going to know it's a it's a J style car J112, and I know it's got uh, it's got a jacket with uh, thermal protection on it. So and it's probably 11 16 inch thick steel. So, you know, we can we can tell that from a variety of different sources without even getting close to the rail car. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question from Carrie. Um, so, what are the top three things you would suggest a firefighter do when he or she arrives? Um, on the scene of a tank car lying on its side. Well, well if the car. Oh, go ahead, JP. If the car is part of a train, the first thing you want for the fire department is to get a hold of the train crew. The train crew is in possession of the documents. And before 
trying to evaluate that car on its side, you want to make sure to, to know, as per the documents, what's inside of the car, because the placards you have on them today indicate always the loaded movement. So that car might be a residue. If it's a being flame impingement, it's going to pressurize big time before a loaded car. So the first thing we tell them is to obtain the documentation, know what you're up against and what you have within those cars. So that would be my first thing. So Franco, uh, identifying the, uh, the, the dangerous goods and using, using your ERG guide and setting up the perimeter zone. So that would be it. All right, thank you. We have another question from Dave. Um, he's wondering if anyone will be able to access this tool and how it will be used for training. Um, and also if independent entities could use it for their own training. Danielle, you can probably answer that better than we can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I know this yet. Um, I do have someone on the line who's more involved in it. So I'm wondering if Christina or Jeff know that answer. Hi, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, the good thing about the virtual reality technology is that we'll have two versions of it. So we'll have the headsets, which we'll be able to take with us to um, different conferences and different types of events where the safety training might not be present. Um, and the second aspect is the web-based version of a virtual reality tool. So there's going to be eventually, once this gets up and running, there's going to be a hosting platform on the TransCare website. Um, so I'll be accessible to anybody who's interested and uh, knows about the TransCare website. Um, and there's a, sec a second part to that question. Um, Danielle, could you repeat it? So I just want to make sure I'm answering correctly. Um, could independent entities use it for their own training? <laughs> yeah, I believe so. Like it, it doesn't, I think it could be useful for um, people involved in government, people who are first responders, or um, even just stakeholders who are involved in TransCare. I think it could be um, beneficial to anybody really involved in the initiative. So. Great, thank you. Okay, um, hopefully that answers that well enough. So we'll move on to the next question from Cody. Um, and he's wondering what construction code are rail cars built to? Um, is it ASME section uh, eight? Well, getting in, I, I, I'm not gonna get too technical into the uh, how they're constructed, but the, yeah, there is there is AS, ASME standards for that, and, and everything goes through uh, the uh, AAR tank car committee as far as uh, uh, as far as certified facilities and, and uh, rail car constructors, and and of course that's all by various different standards that are uh, that are uh, uh, set out through uh, uh, um, uh, Transport Canada and uh, and the FRA, the US DOT, and you know so there are specific standards, so you just can't become a, a tank car facility without having, you know, say certified welders and, and you know, various kinds of spec steel kind of thing. So uh, yeah, everything is spec'd out so that uh, there, everything is, everything's the same. Okay. Um, and next we have Max. Uh, he says the virtual, uh, the virtual tour is a great demonstration tool. That, what value do you think it has for actual training? I know I, I I I have an opinion on that. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you. Five years ago, I would have said hands-on is the best. I kind of still do, but uh, you know, we've had we've we've tried a couple different uh, VR stuff, and like the headset um, is really good, and um, you can use it. And, and it's, you know, not not just for you know this kind of training. You could do it like if you're loading rail cars or trucks or something like that. There's all kinds of different applications. I'm sure everybody's aware of that. Um, but it, it's really good and you're and you really you know you might not have to travel or something like that or you can you know do it in a classroom you don't have to be outside in the elements but uh, you know uh, so it's a great great tool it's another tool in our toolbox uh, but I still like hands-on stuff sorry <laughs> okay we have a few more questions before our time's up so um, I, I also have a few questions myself so why are there so many stencils on the rail car and is this normal? Not really. Uh, the, the car, uh, 
being the uh, property or the ownership of CIAC and afterwards the RAC, uh, there's a lot of people that contributed to putting this car together. And not only that, but maintaining it over the years. And so that's why you see uh, company names like, uh, or organizations like Iraq or uh, Chemtrade or uh, certain railways, CNCP, uh, Central Maine Quebec Railway. These are all uh, the industry that participated in maintaining this car. And so I guess it's a tribute to them to show that they were involved at one point in making sure this car can be in top shape and be utilized by all these railways as well to be able to present them and do sessions with first responders. And again, you know, and yeah, because again, this car isn't isn't typical, right? You know, it's got all those sponsor logos on it. But from a regulatory standpoint, there is stuff that is required, like the reporting mark and some of the stencils with the weights, and then the qualification stencil at the other end of the rail car. These are required stencil by law um, through uh, through um, AAR Tank Car Committee and AAR uh, interchange rules, um, and and you know, as adopted by uh, Transport Canada. And and again the FRA. So uh, so some are some are required and some are optional on on this like this card. We had it pretty well covered, pretty good. Okay, and I think we have uh, time for maybe one more question. So from Carrie, can you describe how the use of the headset headset is uh, different from this session? I'm not sure if you have the knowledge of that or if we should turn that over to Christine. I can I can make a comment. The only thing I would uh, I have tried the headsets and they're much more detailed than what we're doing here. And you can you can I'll just give you one quick example. Is that we, we you could you could put yourself up on top of the rail car and I found myself looking for the handrail because I was that high up and it actually felt like I was there. So um, that's pretty good. So it was much more detail with the headset. Okay, great to know. All right, it looks like we've addressed all of the questions here um, and we're getting to the end of our time. Um, so thank you once again, Andy and JP for joining us. Um, for any questions that may maybe come up after the session or uh, we weren't able to get to, please feel free to re reach out with uh, any questions, comments or concerns and we, we will be sure to follow up. Um, also, please stay tuned for information on the next webinar in this series, which will be highlighting a few stories of responsible care in action over this very challenging and unique year. Uh, so with all that being said, I want to thank everyone for coming and thank our, our uh, panelists today. Uh, and we wish everyone a great uh, afternoon and weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.